It's waiting for this to update. And then we should be able to go live in five, four, All right, welcome back. We are INFR3110, um, Game Engine Design and Implementation in the Fall 2020 semester at Ontario Tech University. And it's week seven, part one of our broadcast. Today we're going to be talking about a few things, game design patterns, specifically sequencing patterns. So not necessarily design from a programming perspective, but design from a game development perspective. So we'll talk about those things uh, in, in a bit. But first, what I want to talk about is our schedule. So where are we? We're sitting here. Um, we are at uh, week seven, so it's October 30th, Devil's Night, right, uh, so to speak. And um, so we're going to also briefly chat about memory management. I'm going to bring this back next week again. Uh, next week, we may have a special guest uh, coming up as well. I think Mr. or Dr. Kapralos is going to uh, join us for a brief time next week. So uh, just watch for that. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, a couple things. So we're going to be talking about double buffer, what that is, how does it work for games. Very briefly, games, game loops you should know about already. Um, and s the other stuff where it says serialization, smart pointers, and memory management, because it's it requires more time to talk about, I'm going to include it in a talk that we're going to have together next week. So I'm going to bring that forward uh, as a topic. Notice also that there is checkpoint two as well as group assignment two, part one, part two, and part three. I'm gonna talk about group assignment uh, first. I'm gonna start with the group assignment uh, discussion and discuss how, what you guys all need to do and all that kind of stuff. I've created, for those people who are just joining me um, or us, there are um, a couple things happening. One is we've got a checkpoint happening today. So uh, this is a, uh, a semester project checkpoint that we're gonna be doing uh, together. And I'm going to go about it the same way we did it last time, which means I'm going to stop recording at some point. Then we're going to go out and um, connect in our project teams. Uh, I'm going to get you guys to do a brief discussion, very, very uh, quick, around um, similar to what you did with James this week for his uh, for his review. And uh, But you're going to go into specific details around game engine design and implementation and the stuff that you're doing for our GDW project uh, the uh, aligned assignment portions that are specifically for this course. So focus on those things. Um, and what I'm really looking for is a, a quick demo of your game, if you can, if you have it. If you don't, if you just want to give me a quick rundown, uh, I'm, I'm at least looking for a uh, your PowerPoint slides related to, or your uh, it could be a link to your Google slides. You'll see that in the document in a second. But that's really about uh, Project Checkpoint 2. In order for us to do Project Checkpoint 2 today, um, so I'm going to make it different than what we did last time. It was a little bit less organized than I would have liked last time. Um, what we're going to do today is if you could please sign up for your groups. So people who are coming in right now, there is a big long list of groups that you have to sign up for. There are two. One is for your uh, group project groups. That's what they're called. And it's like Group Project 1, Group Project 2, and so on. Um, and there are 15 groups I've made. Please uh, select a group, obviously, that your other team members are on. You'll see that there's probably one or more people that have already signed up for your, um, your groups, and that's great. What I'm hoping is that uh, you can all sign up before we start, so that way um, we can kind of get moving on this, and uh, there shouldn't be any issues in terms of doing the checkpoint. So again, we'll do the checkpoint offline. Um, I'm thinking today uh, what we might do is we might go into Discord instead of doing a little break breakout room that we did uh, here um, and only because I think Discord might be a little bit easier um, I know they have we have some we probably can use our uh, you know kind of our um, le it says lectures 3 if I'm not wrong I think we have access to uh, to use chat on the Discord channel. If not, then what we'll do is we can get together on, I don't know, if, if I'm not sure if everyone's in on the um, the Game Jam channel, but I'm sure they're going to allow us to do this as well. We can figure that out. Worst case, we can use Zoom. I'm okay with using Zoom. The thing with it is the breakout rooms are kind of funny and I have to put you there um, as opposed to everyone just joins on Discord and we're good to go. All right, so we don't have a dedicated Discord server for this class. I think going forward, Maybe in the next iteration, I might do that. 
um, just to make it simple. But uh, we'll see how that goes um, just after we get to that point. Okay, so that's project checkpoint two. Um, then there's also group assignment two. Group assignment two is you take your GDW group and you break it up into uh, two, two parts, uh, mostly. The, like we did for group assignment one, I'm allowing you to mix and match those groups if you would like. If you want to work with a different set of people compared to what you did last time, um, you have the means to do so now. Um, so you don't have to stay in the same groupings that you were last time. So let's say, example, you had seven people in your group and you were three and four. Well, you can split that up into different ways. That's why I've given it a, 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 I've created a second group uh, set for, for the, those groups. So that way you don't feel, you don't have to feel, um, uh, you know, obligated to stay within the same groups. It's up to you how you re reorganize, but there needs to be at least a split of two groups for the most part. Some of you um, have a group that's functioning in GDW and only part of that group is here in this class. So of course, you may only take up a whole group of four and that's happened before in the past as well. That's perfectly fine to do so. I don't expect you guys to break up into teams of two um, only because for the next group assignment, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, I would say, in terms of scope than uh, than what I did for group assignment one. And I mean that only in, in that there's a little, there's a few more parts, not because it's more challenging in terms of tech, uh, technology or um, programming. I don't think that's the case at all, but we'll, let's see how you feel about it afterwards. Um, so that is kind of what we're talking about today as where we're at. Um, so just to recap, last week we talked about the flyweight pattern um, and object pooling and I posted notes about the observer pattern. So I'm hoping that you guys can use some of those Again, it all comes down to the time that we have together guys I don't want to overload you with watching a bunch of PowerPoint slides. I think that's not a great exercise I think it's better that we do stuff together and more be more interactive But I also want to post the notes so that way you can get going on the things that you need to do uh, when we're together So what are we doing this week? So this week you completed individual assignment one with Nick um, just to get a hands, a show of hands on the participants panel. How did you guys find that? Did you guys, let's see if you, if you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, maybe there's a thumbs down. I don't know if there's a thumbs down. Let's take a look. There is, there's a thumbs down and a thumbs up. Let's see if we can do that instead of the check mark today. All right. So thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. Um, I want to check, take a look at that. And for those people who didn't like it, I see that some people, most of you liked it. There's a couple, I think there's, there's one. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but does anyone want to talk about, just in chat, um, it's individual assignment one. Individual assignment one that I'm asking about, uh, uh, Matthew. So how did you find individual assignment one? You know, and most people think that it's pretty good with thumbs up. Um, so, I, we, I mean, the idea was that I was trying to make it easier for you guys, right? So it was a 2D game. Some of you may have had trouble. I know that uh, um, yeah, okay, uh, Kaylin, you have, you have a good point. I mean, I think it's it's trying to I'll, I'll take that into account for individual assignment uh, two. If you need more time, uh, would it make sense for you if we had it uh, due at least at midnight? Would that make more sense? And I want to make sure that that would be. Thank you guys for the feedback. Um, so clear that. Yeah. So that's that's not a great thing. You prefer the midterm. Some people prefer the midterm. Yeah, I know. It's it's not meant to be. I'm just getting feedback for those people who are watching on YouTube right now. Um, Twenty four hours. Let's see what I can do. Like, I'll talk to Nick about it last time. I mean, really, what his tutorial is about is to help you through the assignment, and you should be able to uh, to get it done. That's the idea within the time frame. That's that's the, the idea behind it. It's not supposed to be uh, something that's going to take up, um, you know, more than a couple of hours. Uh, when I timed it for myself, when I did it, I mean, and again, I can't just look at it for myself but if I double the time or triple the time that I took it should take still I mean I was able to do it within about um, 20 minutes I would say like all told just me taking my time so my thoughts are that if, you, if I tripled it then you could probably do it within a couple hours 
let's say. Um, but that's not taking into account people's technology issues. The fact that Unity, unfortunately, and I have to put my hand up on this one, um, my Unity messed up. And I'll talk about a couple of things that happened to me this week um, because I had issues with my computer. My power supply uh, died <laughs> somehow. Uh, it's a Corsair Platinum uh, platinum rated AX uh, 1200i C, uh, G, uh, sorry PSU and um, you know it just doesn't work for whatever reason so I've ordered another one it just came but I've had to shift to my uh, uh, to my laptop and that's part of the reason why you saw the unity update to uh, 2020.1.10 um, Anyway, so what ended up happening was that um, I had technology issues, which probably caused you to have technology issues. So I think, uh, and uh, other uh, comments I have is I think starting from scratch was in some ways easier. I could have, but I think the, the problem with starting from scratch is that there's a lot. I wanted you to start with something to modify, which is more realistic, uh, Christian, just, just responding to what you said. Uh, because sometimes you'll get something and then you know you've been asked to code something and then it's if I gave you something from scratch then it might have been a way longer assignment and I didn't want it to be a long assignment at all so um, so that was the the thing with it but thank you for that feedback I'm gonna take it back so because we're gonna have another one I um, mean if you look at our schedule we have one more uh, individual assignment too which is happening in a few weeks so that's gonna be another one of those similar format You'll be getting together with Nick. Um, I'll probably try and I'm going to try and gauge it so that we can make it at least until midnight. Let's say I know some people are saying 24 hours. Um, sometimes that's tough, but let's let's try for at least for midnight that day. And then if you go in and if you can finish within the time frame, that's pretty awesome. That'll be great. Um, but again, it's all these things are is practice for you, so that when we hit the big final exam, you guys are comfortable with the platform that you're comfortable with the things that I've asked you to do and it should align with some of the things that you're doing. They kind of all, the scope here, the idea with these little assignments, the group assignments and the individual assignments was to get you guys, you know, into the technology. So when you do the, the group assignment, the big semester assignment, the GDW assignment equivalent, you know what to do. And for your, for your uh, final exam, you, you have enough practice that you can be uh, fairly capable of finishing the technology portion within a reasonable time frame. I think that's where we went with all this stuff. So that was the the uh, um, the justification for why all these little little assignments are, are there. The other thing I want to talk about is, but well, thank you for that feedback, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, the other thing I want to talk about today was this: why we broke the group assignments up into several parts. Um, again, it's just to make it chunkable, so that way you could. Um, it makes it easier for you to to kind of hand in or submit part of the assignment um, you know here and there and then also so that if because some people we found um, in past years would wait until the last minute to hand in their group assignment and they would take a hit in terms of marks right this way there's several chances for you to hand in parts of your assignment and um, I think the feeling is that we, we're going to see an uptick an up uplift in marks which is what I wanted right and also from an understanding perspective, um, giving you some submission dates makes you kind of submit. And um, and I think this is good because it kind of sharpens you up in terms of the stuff that you have to do. I, f I find that if you have open submission deadlines, we tend to leave those for the very end. So that's where that comes from. All right, so let's get back to the what we're doing today thing. So, um, so group assignment two part one two three is released there's different due dates so one of them is due next week okay so that's uh part one is due next week uh, i'll talk about what's what is due and when it's due part two is due um week 10 so that's you know a couple weeks out from week one uh, or part one next week is week eight so you have two weeks from from next week to get part two done and then part three is done a week after that and you'll see why that is due the week after that. It's not a, as big of a part. So that's those things. We're going to talk about that today. And of course, if we can, I'm going to see how far I can get into sequencing patterns. Uh, this is the lecture portion. So we got a lot of stuff on the docket today. I'm just going to go back to um, Canvas to take a look at all those things. These are all the things that I put up on Canvas today. It's lots and lots of stuff. I put the PDF for the, the PowerPoint. I still have MailPilot, which I'll get you guys to use today because 
Never mind that we have all that stuff, but we also have an interactive exercise, an in-class exercise for bonus. Let's talk about that first. And I want you guys to do this bonus when I'm working with the other teams. Because remember, there's going to be a, a part of the time that I'm going to be working with the other teams. This thing is going to be due uh, Sunday. I've kind of moved it off, even though it's an in-class exercise. It's almost like a small little assignment that you guys are going to do with your GDW team. So the, the big group right, as an example, and it's going to help you with uh, your group assignment two, part three. So this is kind of a, a precursor to that where you learn how to do your memory and CPU profiling, which is something that I'm going to be asking you to do in group assignments two, okay, in general. So this is kind of the in-class exercise you'll be doing while I'm meeting with everybody else. I want you guys to start this, at least talk about it. Um, you can organize it how you like. Right. Um, what I'm looking for is leadership here in terms of who's going to do what. You can um, compartmentalize and split this up uh, amongst your group so that it's, it's again, doable and it's not going to take up an inordinate length of time. I don't want to do that. That's not the exercise. Okay. The exercise is you learn a little bit about, uh, about profiling. And I recommend um, if we split this up in terms of um, assignment detail, if you will, um, give it to the person or people that are going to do the, the profiling part uh, for group assignment two. On that, let's talk about group assignment two before we get into anything further. So, just going to pull that in. All right, so group assignment two. Here, let's talk about this. So, this time around, you're building a tutorial level. So, you've got your GDW project. You may already have a tutorial level um, that you're going to be creating for your GDW game. So, this is what you're going to do. You're going to actually add to the last project you made. If you're a non-GW student, okay, and you're someone who is uh, working on their own stuff for me for your, your final uh, group project, and there's only a couple students like that, this would add to that project. So let's not, I'm not making it so that you have um, a lot to do in terms of a, new, a brand new project. I'm not looking for that. I'm, I'm looking for another level. So, for example, in Unity, that would mean another scene, okay? For you guys who are in GDW, what I'm looking for is for you to make a tutorial level for your game. The tutorial can be very straightforward and simple. It doesn't have to be very much in depth. And what I mean by that is I'm not looking for a lot of uh, crazy amount of polish. It needs to look nice, but I don't, I don't mean for it to be something that is um, insane in terms of polish. That's why it's due next week. Okay, so what I mean is a very simple, here's a few steps. Maybe what I'm asking for is... Um, Okay, so let's let's go through it. Uh, players should be able to learn the main mechanics of your game through a guided tutorial. So when I say main mechanics, I'm hoping that you have one or two unique mechanics that you can learn. Okay, so nothing that I'm not. Uh, you don't have to tell the player how to use the the gamepad, okay, or something crazy. I mean, people should know how to do that. I'm talking about how to, you know, if there's something that you want them to do, you know, um, those are the things that. Um, you want to show them. So again, I'm looking for a couple, I'm thinking one or two main mechanics that are unique to your game. Those are the things that you want to use the guided tutorial for because that makes sense, okay? It may include, but not limited to, UI elements, waypoints, to-do list on the HUD, um, restricting mechanics until they have, taught, uh, they, they have been taught and so on, okay? So you can do all those kind of things. So in other words, that level, you may stop a player from doing certain things like as an example, if you're if you're doing a 3D um, grappling, hook, grappling hook platformer or something like that, don't let them platform until they learn how to use the grappling hook. That's what this means. The game level should be playable to some degree. Okay, what I mean by playable, it doesn't have to be fully polished. I'm not looking for a fully polished playable level, but it has to be reflective of your GW game. Okay, um, your main characters must be controllable. So again. Um, if you're going to include more than one main character in the tutorial, uh, I, I recommend making it single player uh, tutorial, but I'm going to give you the leeway to do whatever you like to do for your, your game. I think that's important. Um, version control must be used throughout the development process, just like before, right? And um, your the game should be aesthetically pleasing, okay? So in other words, the nicer it looks, obviously you're going to get higher marks um, you're also going to create a short video. So that is what you need to do by next week. So, um, and I need to point this out. It's next week. It's not two weeks from now. It's we have, We're kind of on a tighter timeline uh, in the second half of semester. So um, we, 
I can't really provide an extension beyond next Sunday. Just letting you know. Um, how can we do groups of up to three members if our GW groups are mostly seven? Like I said, you can go three and four, Dylan. I've made it so that the groups can be as high as four people. Okay? So that way you can split up however you like. Okay? Just like we did last time with group assignment part one. Okay. Is the due date on Canvas incorrect? Is it? That would be bad if it was incorrect. Let's see. Uh, just a momento. It should say group assignment part one is November 8th. Yeah, that's that's correct. That's next week. It says November 10th. Okay, let's, let's see how that looks. Hold just a moment. I will go into this thing. And by the way, group assignment, whenever you go into the group assignment, it should say um, the due date up here, right, as an example. And then there's going to be, um, the, it's due November 8th. And I think it's open until November 10th, just in case uh, you, um, again, if you're going to be late, I'm giving you a couple days leeway, you'll lose marks, but at least you have a couple days leeway. I'm, I'm not a, I don't like giving, you know, impossibly firm uh, due dates. And what I mean by that is like, okay, it's 1159. And if you've, if you've, uh, you know, submitted after 1159, you get zero. I'm, I don't agree with that policy typically. So I give you a couple days grace. And what I mean by that is if you're late, at least you'll get part marks as opposed to zero marks. Okay. That's what I kind of do. So that's assignment part one, part one. Notice that there's a base that's worth 25 points. This is what you're building and the demo video, the base is what I'm looking for. So very simple guided. It could be, um, canvas labels that you put in, uh, that kind of thing. Notice it says may include, but not limited to UI elements and so on in your base. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for any design patterns at this point for next week or anything like that. No optimizations, just so that you guide your players um, so that they know how to use the main mechanics of your game. Okay, something that's useful for your GW game as well. Okay, so that is what's due next week, Sunday. Okay, and a little video, of course, like you did before. Okay, so again, that's between uh, two groups that you'll be doing and if you do incorporate this uh, tutorial level again in your final project, then what you can do is pick the best tutorial level of the two, just like you would if you were going to include the um, uh, the uh, kind of um, you know level designer that we had created in group assignment one, part one and two. Okay, so you can choose the best of those to include in your GW if you so care to. Okay, it's not required. But I highly recommend that these things, if you do them group assignment one uh, and group assignment two, that they'll work towards your GDW final project if you do both of them nicely. Okay, so that's that's where it is. So that's group assignment two, part one. Um, group assignment two, part two, notice I broke it up just like last time, is due week 10, like I said. In this case, you must, you know, must use two design patterns, new ones, okay? Uh, the two that you, uh, you can choose from are from this list observer flyweight object pooling and state pattern we've done object to object pooling that would be probably much easier for you to do object pooling if you're going to have anything like bullets particle systems enemies whatever you can use object pooling for um, flyweights are a little bit more challenging okay observer is not so bad in state uh, that can be used for scene management um, enemy eye, steering behaviors, collision management, all kinds of stuff that you can do with state. So any one, any two of these, these design patterns would count as uh, 20 marks of the next part. Okay. Now this is why this is longer. Here's the next part, a management system. You must include a quest management system for your tutorial level. So in other words, something that basically says, Hey, here is, um, you need to do this. Okay. And in as a quest management system, you got to kind of show progression, like you've seen in other games. So when someone is done, maybe there's a check mark or a some kind of checkbox uh, or a bullet that's that appears there, or something that you cross out of a list, a to-do list of items that you have to do to make sure that the, all the um, you know the uh, uh, your players are trained to do what you need them to do in terms of your your tutorial level. Okay, so that is what it is. It's used for facilitating the tutorial. So that's the new thing. It's a quest management system. Again, I recommend you could split this off into two different people, right? So that uh, they're uh, not necessarily interrelated. 
uh, or dependent upon each other. So that's kind of two different pieces there. And there's a third, there's a DLL, right? So that's why you have a couple weeks to, to do the next part. The DLL is very similar to what you did for your midterm test. Your midterm test, I asked you guys to do a uh, logging system. You could literally almost lift that logging system for the most part and, um, and put it in here. So what this is, is basically, and it's not really nice to save info about the player's gameplay in a text file. And what this means is hit accuracy ratio. So it's a logging system, a number of ability uses, uh, you know, death times and locations, win rates, basically stats about the player's uh, info for your specific game. So this is game specific as opposed to um, something that I gave you guys for your midterm. So it's not the midterm test, but you can use the same kind of technology that you use there, lift that DLL and, and include it specifically for this. You're also probably gonna have, if I'm not wrong, game user, games user research next semester, and this will be a really nifty and useful tool for you uh, for that course coming forward, because you're gonna have to do some kind of user research, if I'm not wrong, uh, for GER. Uh, I'm not sure if Pedgman is doing it next semester or if it's Samantha. But whoever's doing it, um, it's going to help you guys out for the next semester. We don't have to build off of our last assignment, Marcus asks. Uh, if our current project is farther ahead, can we just fork it uh, for this assignment, second assignment? Absolutely. Remember, what I'm asking you to do is, is an extension of your GDW project. All right. So you don't have to base it off group assignment one. Group assignment one was a, a little uh, research project, if you will, or an experiment. Uh, to get you guys to do a level designer, a level editor, that you may or may not use with your GDW game. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of what uh, the second part is. So the second part's a little bit longer, and it's due week 10, okay? Part three is the final piece, and this is the part that I'm gonna get you guys to practice first today with your in, uh, with your in-class assignment, and it's really about memory and performance optimization. So how does memory and performance optimization work? Well, you need to kind of show a before and after, right? Um, and the way to do that, of course, is screenshots, um, proof in the video uh, as an example. And the way this works is you use the performance profiler that we're going to be talking about today to basically um, to get before and after shots of your memory and your CPU performance. That's what the, those are the two things I, I want you guys to do. It says you must utilize un the Unity profiler to measure the performance of your build. Note, this may require implementing the same system twice. Why? So before you optimize, this is where I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you don't have to do double the work. I recommend putting in your memory profiler early, even though it's not due until week 11. Your results aren't due until week 11, right? However, you probably want to put that into play as soon as possible. And so that way you can compare what the, your, your memory and CPU utilization looks like before you do your optimization patterns, right? That we talked about earlier, which are object pooling, uh, the observer pattern, flyweight and state, these ones, okay? So before you implement these patterns, and I highly recommend at least one of the uh, optimization patterns, which you might see um, improvement on. By the way, you can include other patterns as well if you want to, um, you know, if it, if it helps you from an optimization perspective, okay, you could include other patterns or other ways of optimizing your script, but try and show the difference. What I'm looking for is when you're in part four, give me a before and after. What, here's a before state, before I did any optimization, here's the after state, after I had added flyweights and object pooling, as an example, okay, and factories or whatever else you, add, you added in. All right, so that is uh, group assignment three, um, Part three, group assignment two. It should say group assignment two, part three. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, they say group assignment part, yeah. Group assignment, it should say group assignment two, part two, right? There you go, group assignment two, part one. Okay, I'll be all right. Anyway, so you get it. You got, hopefully you get the, any other questions around group assignment uh, two? Again, there's notice that the demo video portion takes up 15 points. Why? Five points per part. That's why. Okay, it's not because it's worth 15% necessarily of the difficulty, but rather that I want to give you credit each time you do a video so that you don't feel like you're wasting your time. It's worth something, guys. Always. All right, to do something. If you do something, 
in my books, you should get something, right? So that's why uh, I'm getting it. Like, I'm doing it like this for you. To submit, every time you submit something, I'm looking for your GitHub repository and your a link to your to your uh, five minute video presentation. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm not looking for your actual presentation document necessarily because there shouldn't be any at all except for your title slide. Okay. Any questions around group assignments uh, two, um, part one, two, three? The due date should be listed nicely on Canvas. Please take a look at these. So if I if I look at Canvas again, let's go back to the, to the uh, our module page. Not for now, no. Roderick says that's good. Thank you. Notice it says November eighth, November twenty second, and November 29th of the due dates for everything. Okay, and the points associated with them are different. Every assignment has slightly different points. I think this will be a, it could be a fun assignment for you guys to do because I think it links in nicely to your GDW. And I know James always likes tutorialization. So if you already have something, this is great. It's a nice, uh, you know, kind of fit for you guys. You can just adapt what you already have and then make your stuff work. All the projects should be submitted with ex executable. I don't need it um, this time around. Um, last time there was a little bit of confusion. Um, if you give me your GitHub link, I can build it. As long as it's buildable from your GitHub, I'm fine. All right, so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so I don't want, I don't necessarily need an executable, although I do need a clean project up on GitHub that works. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm going with those three parts. All right, so this has been explained. Let's take a look at checkpoint two. So what am I expecting today from checkpoint two? So when we get together, there are some directions here. So one, Present an update of your semester project. So today I'm looking for that. I'm also, please indicate progress towards your GDW or non-GDW requirements for this course. Okay, so I know that there might be other extraneous stuff that you talked about. Um, my hope is that you'll kind of say something like, hi, my name is, I'll, if it was me, it'd be, hi, my name is Tom, and this is my team, you know, uh, Product of Primes, as an example, and you know, today we're presenting our game, Manos Returns, and here's what we're doing, blah, 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 right? And then, and how does it, re you know, relate to uh, uh, game engines? Well, we've added this part, this part, this part for, uh, as we're moving towards, uh, you know, kind of the next checkpoint for game engines, right? And if you haven't done something, I need to know that too. If you have no progress towards your, your, um, uh, your semester project related to game engines, I need to know, because this is part where you're gonna get, um, marks related to that. Notice that this, this as well as the other checkpoint, are bonuses. That means if you're ahead, if you're kind of incorporating stuff that we've talked about in class, and you show me progress towards your um, your final project, I'm giving you a bonus, guys. Right? So I think there's nothing wrong with, with uh, getting it done at all. Um, all right, sorry. So I got a question from Roderick. For assignment two, do you just check out a given push when marking, since we're just pushing all parts of the same repo? Um, well, really what I'm looking at, Roderick, is your video. So I'm looking to see what each group has first. I want to see how you explain stuff and everything else. So the first thing I look at is your video, right? And then, um, and if it's not me, it's Nicholas. He's going to look at your video. Um, also, if you're going to have the, share the same repo uh, as an example, then what I recommend is definitely share on, when you do your submission, uh, mention the branch, if there's different branches of, of development which branch is for which team. So that way, um, Nicholas or I will know which branch to look at when we're marking. Okay, that's an important part. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. All right, so, so this is checkpoint two. So checkpoint two, we're gonna get together. Um, I'm gonna get together with your GDW groups and then um, my expectation is that you'll show me your progress towards your, your final project. If you have no progress towards your final project, I would be concerned at this point because we're just slightly past the mid mid point, if you will, of the course. We're kind of more than halfway through, I would say, sitting at October 30th, right? So, um, so my hope is that you have progress towards your uh, game engines component for GDW. That's what I'm hoping that I'm going to see today. Okay. Um, doesn't always have to be the case. Everyone's different in terms of time frames and the way you organize yourselves, but I'm hoping that um, we'll see some positive news here when it comes to that. So that's what Checkpoint 2 is all about, and we're going to get to that uh, shortly. Let's go back to the module page to make sure we've got everything. So um, I talked about um, 
your group assignment two. By the way, the group assignment two uh, document that I've shown just now, which is this document here, is up on Canvas. It's right here. So if you wanted to look at the complete document with the entire group assignment two, it's right here. Um, there's also the group assignment uh, two uh, drop boxes or submission points are here, here, and here. So that's where that's how that works in terms of your submission. Um, your in-class exercise submission for that's due by Sunday, which is your, your profiling assignment, which is a group assignment that I'm looking for um, as a bonus that's due Sunday, um, is here. And that gives you all the details of what you need to do while I'm off with the other groups uh, doing that kind of stuff. Okay, so that is what this is. And this is the link to the YouTube video that I'm actually putting on right now. Okay, so that's all the stuff that I've got going on here. I'm actually going to do a little bit of, of uh, theory, and then we're going to uh, break out at, at the midpoint and do the uh, uh, checkpoint two. Yes, Nathan, it's meant to be done with your full GW group. Why? Because I want you guys to get together anyway. It's going to make it so that way you're ready to go. You guys are all working on the same thing at the same time. So when I meet with you guys uh, after I've talked to the other groups, then you've got you know, you've had your time to kind of talk about who's going to do what for your profiling assignment. And then at the same time, you're ready to go for me. If I split you up, then I may get different people ready at different times, or I might disrupt uh, a bunch of people all at once. And I don't want to do that. I want to make it work. This should be an easy one to do if you if you work together as a team. Okay. And again, you can give it to whoever you want in your team. If you if it's the, going to be the programmers, uh, that's fine. But you should talk about who's doing what. And then you guys should all know what this is about because it might be included in your final exam. Okay, so that is all the stuff that we're doing today. It's, again, there's a pile of things, but um, this is game engines and we've got lots of stuff to, to go through. All right, let's let's uh, let's get back to the, uh, I wanna talk about the actual um, theory part now. So this, we've talked about all this. Any questions before we move on? Because I wanna kind of, make sure that you guys are good with everything that I've given you. So again, individual assignment four is out. Project checkpoint two, we're gonna do after the this little um, uh, theory piece that we're doing right now. I've also released group, just saying it again, group assignment two, part one, two, three, okay? And I've made two sets of groups. One set of, one group set is for group assignment two, which can be group members of up to four people taken from your GDW groups, as well as another group set for your final project groups, right? So that means that's your entire GDW team. It should be up to seven people, if I'm not wrong. I'm, I'm guessing you have up to seven people. I don't think you're, I don't think you have more than seven people in your groups, if I'm not wrong. If you do, please let me know. I'll change that immediately. So that way you don't have any issues with any of that stuff. I'm just going to pause the share for a second. So I, so I don't share anything on, I better not do that. Actually, I'm still on YouTube. That I can't do. Okay, let's get to it. So hopefully you've done that already. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about sequence patterns. So I'm just gonna get into the theory now. So sequence patterns, we've talked about programming patterns in the past. Okay, so these pa these patterns can be programming uh, related, but a lot of times there, we set up these patterns as part of our game engines. The stuff that I'm gonna be talking about right here. Okay, so the first pattern we're gonna be talking about is double buffer. And you guys should know about double buffering because of graphics, right? It should be nothing new to you. What is double buffering? Um, it is a design pattern. And really what the intent is, is cause a series of sequential operations to appear instantaneous or simultaneous. And how do we make that happen? What we do is we, we have multiple, what we call uh, buffers, when I first heard about buffers, when I was uh, learning graphics, I, I always thought about the pattern buffers on Star Trek. I was like, pattern buffers, cool, we can teleport. That's not the kind of buffers we're talking about. We're talking about pixel buffers more than anything else. So we'll talk about what those are really briefly. Um, so even though we have multi-core architectures and multi-threading, it doesn't mean that um, we still don't need buffering. Buffering is great because we use it for all kinds of things, but you can use buffering for more than just pixel buffering, which we'll talk about in a second. So a typical example of double buffering is this idea for rendering. And what we do, we use double buffering for graphics. And I'm just gonna do a bit of a review of what that looks like, right? 
So remember the old CRT days? Maybe you guys don't remember. remember. I remember it because I grew up with CRTs um, and they became flatter and flatter. First, they were really, really big or massive. They were, you know, they, you couldn't lift one. Um, and especially when they got bigger, like 17 and 20 inch displays. That was like the biggest we ever had. Um, and those were massive and they weighed a ton. Um, and they got smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner until finally they went away and we they became LCDs um, and plasmas and all those things as they move towards uh, the new OLEDs and you know 4K displays and all that stuff that we have today. But before, it wasn't like that. I remember that the technology of the past, this is just a review, you guys should know this already, used this idea of cathode ray tubes, right? Which is really an electron gun. <laughs> That's what it was, that basically fired at your eyes, um, you know, kind of uh, multiple frames per second. That's really what it was. And, you know, uh, I remember my parents would always tell me, don't go so close to the to the television or to the monitor, Tom, because, you know, it's going to burn your eyes out. And you know what? They weren't wrong <laughs> because there's a lot of radiation coming off these things compared to what they uh, what we have today. Um, so really, when we think about um, what this was, there's a bunch of scan lines. That's what they were. And um, they had an array of pixel picture elements. Uh, that we call pixels. Again, you've learned this hopefully with Dr. Hogue or whoever did your graphics class the last time, but that's what pixels are, are, that's where they come from, picture elements. And they were basically each pixel is just a color, right? A color and a position more than anything else. And you should have known that also from graphics. So a very, very straightforward idea. Um, a lot of times when it comes to CRT monitors or even some of our uh, coordinate spaces that we use today, uh, it's top left corner is is how they would scan and so think about this the electron gun from the CRT would scan at the top left corner and it would scan to the right and then back and scan to the right and then back and keep on scanning those are the scan lines that you see on some of those old displays if you actually watch the matrix or any of the, those old movies from the 90s you'll see the scan lines you can actually see them uh, uh, here still and they've even been used recently for kind of these this retro look of different games um, you know, kind of with a post-processing effect. You can make, make it look like scan lines. But the idea, the reason where scan lines came from is it came from the electron gun, the cathode ray tube that basically fired electrons, um, you know, across your, your monitor. Your monitor was made so that when the electrons hit the, the filament, the cathode, right, of, uh, or the, the part of the monitor, that they would glow for a second, right? And not even a second, a portion of a second. And that glow would be in a particular color. Okay, so this is when color monitors were actually out. Because before, there was only monochrome monitors. Amber or green were the typical colors. There's also white. That was also a thing that we, uh, that we had back in the day. Again, these are all things that you should be familiar with to some degree. And the cathode ray, what you would have is, it would kind of look like this. You'd have an electron beam that came out of the, uh, uh, the focusing anode. Again, an electron gun. And the electron gun would fire forward into the monitor, uh, into the screen that you would see, and uh, and this would activate and deactivate. All right, that's what would happen: activate and deactivate and move at the same time. So there'd be actually moving parts um, inside of your uh, of your monitor, and some to some degree, not a lot. I'm talking about what what it really when it really scanned, it would just focus on one part of the screen or the other. So again, like we said, it would there would be like this this scan line that would go back and forth. And then what would happen is when a game came back to the bottom of the screen, so let's say we would scan, 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 we came back to the bottom of the screen, we would we, we do something called a vertical blank, a V blank, which basically would go from the bottom right hand corner of the screen back up to the top, right? And then it would keep scanning again, down, 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 go back to the bottom, go back up to the top. And it would keep doing that over and over again. Every time it did that, that would be a screen refresh. That's what it would be, screen refresh over and over again. Okay, so that's the electron gun. So this idea of a vertical blank or V-blank was where, um, you know, how monitors work. But the problem with that was this interval happened in this fraction of a second. And um, the old uh, consoles that we had, example, at that time, the Atari 2600 and other consoles of that era didn't have enough memory to really store pixel data for the entire screen at once, which kind of complicated the way rendering worked. And so they came up with this idea of a color buffer. So we've talked about buffering. You've, you should know about the uh, buffers that we, we talked about. Basically, buffer is, a, is an array of pixels. That's what they are, or an array of data. Uh, Dr. Hogue always talked about, uh, and I agree with it, which is it's just data, Tom. You just have, tell me that over and over again. Don't worry about it. It's just data, right? 
And I like when we think about our pixels as just data because then we can manipulate that data any way we like with graphics manipulation and post-processing effects. So the idea was originally we had um, a buffer, but we only had one. And so what happened is this buffer would continually uh, update. And there was, what happened was because we only had one buffer at the time, and this is just kind of a, this is a pattern, right? Um, what ended up happening was we had this idea of screen tearing that could occur, especially when um, the, uh, the screen would update and we would wait till the next frame. Think about what a frame is here. A frame is one screen refresh. That was a frame, right? If you think about it, right? Each frame of the screen would refresh, right? The entire screen would refresh X number of frames per second. How many times, how many frames, how many screen refreshes would happen, right, uh, per second? This is also called a cycle or a, a rendering cycle. Each rendering cycle would refresh or redraw the screen with the electron gun every second. That's what that's where it came from, the term frame. But it caused screen tearing sometimes because um, the object would move from one portion of the screen to the other before it the screen had a chance to refresh. So the speed of the object was a big issue, right? So we got to this point of using something called double buffering, where we had a back buffer and a front buffer. And what would happen is we would start with the back buffer, we would draw the back buffer. Meanwhile, we were uh, working on the, uh, while well, the front buffer was being displayed, the back buffer was being, was being drawn or rendered. So we render to a buffer that wasn't being drawn. Okay, that's what would be happening. And then this double buffering system would come into play where we would basically show the front buffer, but the back buffer would be changing and so on, right? And this switching of buffers, this double buffering system, is the way that we were able to limit or reduce um, uh, screen tearing because of the V-blank effect, because of us having to go from the bottom right-hand corner again to the top left corner, right? And this would cause this, the, you know, the, the redrawing of the screen. So that is uh, the double buffering, what double buffering is at a very high level from a graphics perspective, right? This idea of, of, of uh, buffer A and buffer B and drawing from one buffer to the other one, right? Again, when I hear buffer and funny enough, when I, when I first heard the term buffer, I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> what is Why can't they just use array, right? And so when I hear about buffer, I'm thinking about an array of data. In my mind, I'm always thinking about an array of data. I, sub I, just, I just substitute array of data when they say buffer. Double buffer, double array of data, two arrays of data. And I just switch from one to the other. I swap, from one, uh, I swap rendering from one buffer to the other. This idea of double buffering is a pattern, a sequencing pattern that we've been using in game engines for a long time. I'm just going to skip through this. So here's what it would look like. Um, the game would uh, function might look like this, where I have rendering my world, and I want to wait for v blank to happen, and then I'm going to swap color buffers. This is kind of just some pseudocode to do this kind of thing, right? So think about that. I wait for v blank, so when everything gets refreshed, and when I'm done, I swap color buffer color buffers from the back buffer to the front buffer, or the other way around. Okay. Um, some games, uh work actually at higher refresh rates. So one of the things that we had was this idea of refresh rates, 60 hertz, or 60 refresh uh, refreshes per second. The screen, your actual physical hardware, right, in Canada works at 60 hertz for the most part. That is just what our, it, it, it's in alignment with our electrical signals that come from the wall, right? So by default, most screens basic ones, okay? Not the high uh, highfalutin uh, gaming uh, monitors that we have today, gaming LCDs and so on. They work at 60 hertz, the basic ones, okay? If you were gonna buy just an LCD for, for you know, uh, typing out documents, 60 hertz for the most part is your refresh rate. Why? It's sufficient. Most people, again, our persistence of vision does not allow us to see beyond 30 frames per second. That's why movies were always shot at 30 frames per second and 24 frames per second uh, in the past, right? So 60 frames per second, we don't see our line tearing or our um, our scan lines from our monitor. We can't see those things because our eyes aren't sensitive enough to see it. However, if you use the, an old style video camera and you were going to look at a monitor 
as an example. And that monitor was, uh, you know, kind of an old school monitor that was refreshing 60 frames per second, 60 hertz. You could see the scan lines with a video camera. Why? Because the video camera could pick up the differences. It had it had a higher sensitivity than our own eyes, right? So that's why we'd see scan lines when we watch old movies. And um, at the same time, right, some of the monitors now, um, you know, as an example, can support much higher frame rates. And why? Because the higher the frame rate, the more accurately we can see things uh, move across the screen. The more we're able to perceive movement, smoother movement across the scene and less lag, the better we are at competitive games. Or so that's the theory behind it, right? But this idea of V blank, all right, the, because we had an electron gun, would cap our frame rate at 60 frames per second to match with the refresh rate, right? As an example of the screen, the maximum refresh rate of the screen. In Europe, by the way, and in other countries, the cycles. Uh, the electrical cycle on the wall is 50 hertz, right? Not 60 hertz. So that's why some of our uh, or or our LCDs and our our displays that are, if you if you actually take a, a a North American display to Europe, may not work properly. All right. I'm just saying. Even now, some of those uh, there's there's special displays that are made for different places in the world because of the electrical current, the um, the frequency that's running in the back end, right? And how it refreshes. Just keep that in mind. All right, so again, um, some games even, even support things like triple buffering now, because that's a pattern. If we can support more buffers, again, we have another buffer, a third or fourth array of data, right? All I'm doing now is supporting smoother refresh rates, smoother motion on the screen, and which allows me to look to, for my game to look more aesthetically pleasing. And that's where this is going. All right, questions around Buffer. What is a buffer? You should know that by now. We've seen it before. We've seen it when it comes to uh, graphics. You probably learned about buffers when you did uh, your um, computer architecture course. That's part of the requirement. You should have seen something like that. They may have talked about it um, in the in the computer architecture course, and now you should have it a third time at least. Okay, if not more. All right. So I don't see any questions. I'm going to move on. The game loop. You guys should know what a game loop is too, but let's talk about this. This is when, what this class is about. So again, here's the motivation. Let's decouple the progression of the game time from user input and processor speed, All right? And they're really the main game programming pattern if you think about this. Without a game loop, we really don't have a game. Actually, without a game loop, we have no graphics. We have nothing, right? It's really the, the core of the game, right? If I want my game to update, I need some kind of loop. It doesn't matter what platform you're working on, whether it's the web or whether it's on Java or C++, whatever. There's always some kind of game loop, some kind of game loop every single time. And um, really what it does is it controls, it, it, it works with flow control, okay? We just talked about this idea of buffering and how most older monitors would only support 60 frames per second because they were supporting V-blank. This idea that the fastest refresh rate for those CRTs were at 60 hertz. That's the fastest way. So it would cap you at 60 frames per second. Nowadays, that is not the case. You can have much higher frame rates, 120 frames or even higher when it comes to uh, the way your um, your games would work. So what the game loop is, is going to do is going to try and give you, there's a couple of ways the game loops can work. Imagine if I had a uh, my game loop and it would run as fast as possible. Okay, so here's an example of a traditional game loop. My game is running, process my inputs, update my game world, generate my outputs. Pretty straightforward. In fact, if anything, we always want to separate our update function from our rendering function. We always want to do that. And why? Because you may want to put those two different functions on different threads. And we talked about that earlier this semester, actually. Right, so this is kind of what we want to do. But the problem with this is there's no limiting. That means my machine, if my machine is super fast compared to your machine, I might get more frame rate, a higher frame rate than you, which means that it's going to be hardware dependent. Guys, we don't want to make that happen for our game engines and for our games. We want to make our games hardware independent as much as possible. Now, that's not true because if you make you know the, the more the newest games they take up a lot of memory 
there's it requires uh, you know a CPU that's more robust that can operate at, f at much higher rates and so on. Why? Because there's more and more objects in the game, and so there's other things going on that that makes it required that we have our hardware requirements are higher and higher as we go forward. However, we want to try and take away. Let's go to the other extreme end. Imagine if I'm making a game and I want it to be I want it to be compatible with both desktop, well, all of them, desktop consoles as well as mobile devices. I need some way to limit the amount of frames I can pump out, right? Every single second, right? Why? If I don't frame limit re limit what's happening, what's going to happen is some machines are going to run super fast and some machines are going to run super slow and the game will be inconsistent. It won't be, you know, uh, across different uh, platforms that look different, which is not what we want as developers. So what we want instead is when we process these inputs, we want to be able to, um, you know, to uh, limit our game by using something called delta time, right? And what delta time is, I'm going to skip through here because it's just some theory, and you guys can read some of this yourself, and I, I have other things I want to talk about. Think about the, the Pac-Man game loop, all right, what that is. The game loop for Pac-Man is really like this. It starts off while the player uh, player's lives is greater than zero, we're going to grab some input from the joystick, okay? By the way, input, it should be also separate from update. Your input, update, and render function should all be separate. Why? Because our input loop could be, could be um, uh, you know, uh, run, and again, in a separate thread, and it should be, right? But we got to think about what that does. When we have a multi-threaded environment, and we're going to talk about what multi-threading does, it could mean that we're getting input asynchronously from our drawing which means we might have something called frame drops, right? It could happen. We're getting input, but yet what's going to happen is we're trying to move our character from point A to point B, and then because we're asynchronous, we're not time, not everything is timed together, we might get this idea of, of um, you know, uh, frame dropping. We'll talk about that in a second. But think about look, the, this typical scenario here. If we have a, a number of lives, we get our joystick data. We For every ghost in the world, what we want to do is we want to update that ghost. We want to update the AI for that ghost based on the player's position. That's kind of like what the Pac-Man game loop might look like. And then what we want to do is we want to draw the graphics and update the audio. So you can see that there's an, this other part of uh, the game loop happens down in here, right? So this is an example of the entire game loop for Pac-Man at a very high level using pseudocode. So we can get, like I said, more complex when we when we use multiple cores. We talked about multiple cores earlier today when uh, we were talking about double buffering. But let's think about this, this idea of concurrency, the ability for us to do more, um, more than one activity at the same time or simultaneously or uh, multitasking. We talked about that earlier this semester as well. The idea of early multitasking back before we had multiple cores in our CPUs was really task switching. I was switching between one task and another. That was really what it was when we were talking about um, uh, you know, concurrency. There was no true multi-threaded environment. Nowadays, with most of our CPUs having the ability more, more than one core, then we have the ability to, uh, to support a multi-threaded, a true multi-threaded environment. And what that does is it helps us in terms of our, uh, the way our games function but it also can complicate things. And this is why, still, a high um, frame rate, right, for a single CPU, single core, is king when it comes to video games because most games do not use concurrency or multiple cores because it's more complex to program than it is to do a single, frame, a single core CPU. All right, so single core uh, kind of uh, a CPU rate is usually what what makes it so that it's the best gaming CPU out there. Um, recently, AMD has just released their Zen 3 processors, and they're said to compete with uh, the likes of an Intel's i9 and i7 and i5 processors. They're, they're saying that their single core uh, performance for their CPU now is higher than Intel's. And it, there is a, a race between Intel and AMD for this single core performance. Why? Because most video games still use single core when it comes to their their game loop. 
um, but it's possible we can use multi multi uh, multi a multi-threaded environment for other things. Okay, to help us out with uh, with AI or with rendering or something else. Okay, I'm going to skip over this part. My hope is that you'll read this because there's a lot of words here, and I don't want to I don't want to bore you with the, the powerpoints. Okay, but the the data is here for you guys to look at. Please take a look at these things. There may be a discussion near the end of semester again on your especially on your on your final exam around surrounding uh, multi-threaded game loops. Is it good? Is it not good? There's two sides of this. There's there's a, a, a couple of camps when it comes to this kind of thing. Yes, they're good because they allow us to to really take advantage of the CPU architecture. But no, they're not good because not every not all CPUs are are created equal. How many cores do you allot? Do you how, do, can you assume that the, that all CPUs out there have at least two cores, four cores? What's the number, right? How do you do that kind of stuff? And um, if you want to, you know, kind of support um, multiple platforms, does your phone, does every phone have multiple cores that you're gonna, you know, you're gonna support, or are you gonna do some kind of switching? So depending on the platform, platform detection. Oh, I'm on a phone. I'm gonna, I'm going to lower my number of cores and change the way my game loop works. That's really complex coding, right? As an example, compared to, okay, every game, every platform that I'm on is working with this exact same ar architecture, and that's why uh, kind of the draw to single uh, core performance. All right, so I'm just gonna keep moving to this part. So here's where we have this idea of. Uh, the problem with multi-threading I wanted to talk about here. We have uh, uh, input here. A button is pressed here. It's processed it, uh, processed on, on frame 3, as an example, and it's visible by frame 4. What can happen is um, you can have this um, input lag, is what can happen, where I'm I'm kind of inputting something, but because of multi-threading, um, we're, we're perhaps, you know, getting the, uh, the effect or the feeling of lost frames or input lag. Um, where actually what's happening is our game is trying to shuffle uh, between one um, uh, process and another. Okay, I'm just going to go into timing in games. So again, when it comes to 30 frames per second, we know that there it's roughly 33 milliseconds. Uh, you know, again, every frame is 33 milliseconds at 30 frames per second. At 60 frames per second, as an example, it drops to 16 milliseconds, right? So half of this, 16.666 and so on. And at 90 frames, it'll drop further. So that's how it kind of works. And what this means is, is every frame, we do a number of calculations. So the more frames we have, the more calculations we try and, and pack in um, per second. Now, again, not every processor can handle that much. So what you're going to have sometimes is this idea of drop frames. And to fix this problem, what we have is this two parts. There's real time and there's game time, right? Real time seconds, you know, you have uh, are the seconds beat, you know, every time they're, they're, they're the same, right? But in real time, you might have a fluctuation of, of frame rate because your processor, you know, or the, the actual game hardware can't handle it, what you're trying to, you know, get it to do. A good example of that is the, the um, uh, exercise we had last week. Some of you may have noticed that, you know, your processor wasn't able to handle 10,000 tiles, as an example. Not even close. Some of you might have got 20,000 tiles instead of my 10,000, right? It's really, you know, hardware dependent. And to limit that, what we can use is we can use this idea of delta time. So delta time, normally if we didn't use delta time and we said something like my enemy position uh, on the x-axis is you know, I'm going to add five pixels to the enemy position. And again, this is not a great practice, but let's suppose I did this, right? Well, the faster my processor is, then the more pixels I'm going to add every frame, right? And this is bad. That means on a very uh, fast processor, I might add many, many more uh, pixels every frame than on a slow processor. Again, this is it, this will present inconsistency across platforms. So what's the fix? We use um, delta time. And the idea with delta time is it's the elapsed game time since the last frame, okay? So the way it would work uh, and what we want to do is have the last enemy position on the x-axis plus equals 150, let's say, times delta time. And what delta time would do, notice that the number here is bigger, right? Because what it's going to do is it's going to be reduced by the, the, the difference in time from last frame to this frame, okay? So that's what's going to limit it and it's going to provide a more stable and a more um, consistent frame rate between hardware platforms, okay? 
as opposed to um, when we don't use delta time, it just runs as fast as it can. We don't want that. All right, so that is your uh, the idea of our game loop for the most part. Um, there's some, a, a bunch of other stuff we want to talk about as well. Um, think about how uh, our delta time is calculated. We have our real delta time is equal to the time since the last frame. And our game delta time is equal to the real delta time times the game time factor, whatever that is, usually in terms of our frame rate. Okay, so that's how it works. And then we have an update process. We update the game world with delta time. And we also render outputs. All right, so again, separate functions to do that. All right, I'm just going to skip forward and I'm going to talk about uh, one thing we also try and do with game loops is frame limiting. So again, two camps on this one. Do we want our frames are uh, to be deterministic? And what I mean by that is, do we want to determine exactly when our frames will happen? If you impose frame limiting, going back to what we just said, right, that means that you are limiting the maximum number of frames that the hardware can produce. Okay, going back to what we want, that's not always desirable because if we frame limit, right, that means that we can't take advantage of that new hardware that you got out there. All it's gonna do is just gonna run frames more stably, right, if you will. So it's gonna have a stable frame rate and it's not gonna have as many drop frames if you frame limit. On the downside, if you frame limit, you can't take advantage of that new RTX 3090 card that you're going to buy next week, as an example, or the new big Navi card that you're going to buy for Christmas or whatever. You can't take advantage of it because it doesn't matter. It's it's going to be frame limited, right? So you have to find a balance. And what you can do with some careful coding is you can unlock the frames depending on the you know the your um, your graphic processor power and the CPU power. Again, it requires you to detect your underlying hardware and what you can do is you can have settings players always like options I always like to say that I always like options give me options to turn up my hardware settings as much as I can that's why we have th those kind of things I want to go triple buffering if it's a, if it's if you have triple buffering in your game I want to use it if you have uh, super crazy shadows and ray tracing I want to use it I want to see all that kind of stuff if I have the capability to do that right I want to turn my frame rate to 120 frames per second or higher, right? Let me do it if you if you can do that in your game, um, and it'll make me happier as a as a player because I've spent, let's say, as a, as an enthusiast uh, gamer, I've spent all kinds of money on building my gaming rig, and I want to take advantage of it. Okay. So dropping frames is a thing, and it happens on a um, usually on rendering. Okay. Now again. Think about what's what's uh, the the your hardware again. You have a couple of competing things happen at the same time. You have your GPU, your graphics processing unit, which can actually process uh, data much faster in many ways than your CPU. Okay, CPU is for certain calculations, but the GPU is made for rendering. Okay, so now at the same time, if you don't have a big enough CPU, if I have a crazy video card, I can't take advantage of the calculations because my CPU will limit how fast I can go, right? So this is where, you know, um, hardware companies, you know, uh, love enthusiasts, right? Here's an example. Uh, lately, they just announced, uh, AMD announced that their, uh, their big Navi cards were great with their Zen 3 processors. They're kind of saying, hey, you know what? If you buy a big Navi card and you buy our latest Zen 3 GPU or CPUs, guess what? You're going to get way more performance you know, from combining those two technologies, we've optimized, we got a one-click optimization that is going to uh, be even better for, our, for the people who use our hardware, right? So think about that. That's a great marketing tool, but it makes sense. I mean, if you have control of both the CPU and the GPU, that's awesome. And this is where um, AMD in some ways has an advantage over Intel. Intel, although they have Intel graphics, and they're really, actually, they've much improved. The Intel uh, graphics that we have on, on chip, as an example, are gotten better and better over the years. Still nowhere near the quality of NVIDIA or AMD, but they're better, right? But AMD has the advantage. They can do both. They can say, hey, you buy both of our hardware systems, they're going to jive. They're going to work together. And Microsoft, by the way, is on the bandwagon. They're saying, hey, you know what? We want to use AMD's technology, right? to combine these two uh, CPU and GPU to, pr to provide 
you know, extra frames and, and higher performance for, for users. This makes perfect, you know, kind of, it, it's all good for us because when you have AMD and Intel competing with one another, as well as Nvidia, you know, what you're gonna get is better hardware for a cheaper price. So what this means for Nvidia, although they've come up with their, the king of graphic cards, the 3090, right? Their challenge is their 3090 is an external part that is not even is not optimized necessarily with let's say an Intel or an AMD processor, right? So again, you might have frame limiting and frame dropping happening at um, uh, with more challenging games. And there's some great tests out there to uh, uh, that allow you to test, um, you know, uh, different rendering rates and so on that you can do for hardware profiling from a hardware perspective. And that could be a discussion of another time. There's there's lots of, of websites out there. Uh, Gamers Nexus is one of the ones that I follow that kind of, they talked about optimizations. Uh, Jay's Two Cents is also another website that, or another uh, group of people that kind of, um, or YouTuber that kind of talks about optimizations. Uh, for, for Linus Tech Tips, there's all kinds of stuff out there that are, that are crazy out there when they talk about optimizations and they all talk about the same things. How do I get the best bang for my buck and how do I get the most optimizations with the least drop frames so I can play the games as fast as possible? So to me, um, you know, these are the things that, and I'm not putting, you know, kind of uh, shout outs to those people necessarily in the video, but what I'm trying to tell you is that there are sites out there and there's, there are people dedicated to optimizing performance and because of these very problems that we're talking about right here. All right, so let's, let's get moving on this. So drop frames, we wanna try and avoid dropping frames. And the way to do that, of course, is we want to make our frame loop deterministic, right? And this is the way we can do it. We can do it because what we want to do is we want to update our game objects by using delta time. And frame limiting is, is a standard practice out there. But again, guys, if you're going to be the developer, you're going to, if you're going to be the next game engine developer, give me options. That's what I want. Give me options. Let me turn up my, you know, the volume of my, on my hardware as, fa as, as loud as I want, as fast as I want, because I'm paying for it. And, I want, and you know what, the more options I have, the happier I'm gonna be as a gamer. All right, and let's take a look a little bit of, uh, we're, you know, in this course, we're, we're, we're using the Unity game engine as kind of our back end. So Unity actually has a really cool uh, diagram for execution order that I've included here. And this is kind of depicting their entire game loop, right? So it starts off with the awake function. This is where uh, initialization happens. Then there's something called on enable. Uh, that takes that kind of uh, triggers. Um, we are very used to something called start. All right, start is part of our, um, you know, kind of our initialization. So this is the initialization phase right here. So awake and start. We kind of used awake um, last week actually in this course. Then there's fixed update. Okay, there's update, late update. There's a bunch of different kinds of updates, and fixed update works for physics. I always remembered fixed update because f f fixed and physics kind of work together. Fixed update is th this frame limiting stuff that allows you to make sure that your physics, uh, you know, kick off at the same rate. Um, and you can notice that it also takes care of on trigger, on collisions, all that kind of stuff happens with fixed update. Um, then there's also input events on mouse down or on mouse whatever. Finally, it goes into game logic and game logic happens with the regular update. So there's a regular update, and there's also something called late update. So they've, they've included different entry points where you can put different kinds of game logics to function. And a lot of times this can avoid the idea of uh, an execution reordering. We don't want to reorder our execution if we don't have to. You can, you can kind of align uh, different functions to trigger um, at different points in the execution order. All right, so notice also that inside of our regular game logic phase, there's also this idea of a coroutine. And a core routine again is using asynchronous, uh, you know, kind of programming to allow things to, to function, uh, you know, function to trigger, as an example, in a different process, right? So almost like simultaneous or concurrent, okay? Um, what you don't want to do with Unity and, and kind of the um, commercial game engines that are out there is you do not want to try and make your own frame counter or your own. Um, any kind of timing at all. You, you let Unity and the commercial game engine do it on its own. And in fact, if you connect to any kind of framework, we're gonna talk about frameworks today as well, you want the framework to kind of, um, to kind of judge 
uh, how fast the frame will, will, will go from one frame to the other. You want to use their timing mechanisms, not your own, because otherwise what might happen is you might step out of sync with what's happening uh, with the game engine. Scene rendering happens after that. And then um, we get into gizmo rendering, the stuff that you see in your editor, followed by UI rendering. Um, by the way, for those people who don't know, um, Unity also in the background uses um, Dear I Am GUI, right? For a lot of the stuff that they do. I Am GUI is immediate mode UI, right? And again, it's used for um, uh, just editing as, as an example in the background. This is again, the older uh, system. The new execution order doesn't work exactly like this, especially when you use uh, data oriented design, which we'll talk about in a future lesson, as well as a true ECS or entity component system which we'll also talk about in a future lesson. Okay, so this is kind of the way it works. And notice that um, it kind of goes all the way down to on destroy and on disable. So on enables way up here, on disables way down here, and then it loops. And this is the entire execution order of Unity. And you can see the docs uh, if you want more information on that. So how many times, how many games fit this kind of loop? Walking, running, and jumping. We see that over and over again. Um, and you're going to see a lot of this th that stuff a lot of times when we talk about game design we also talk about hey identify your core loop and your game design document should really include this if it doesn't already what is your core loop and how does it work with the physical loop or the hardware software loop that you've included in your game okay so kind of the, some of the things that we've talked about before and then keep in sight what your game loop runs all right so again think about your rules um, your logic, feedback from the player, um, actions, all that kind of stuff works within your game loop. All right, so questions around game loops. Okay, we're coming kind of coming to that middle part of our of our class right now, and we're going to move on to something else in a second. So I just wanted to cover this. We're almost done. Let's talk about the update method. So really briefly, what does the update method do? And remember, we want to keep the update separate from our rendering and input. So the three things we want to think about always are rendering loop is different or a section is different than our update, different than our input. So input handling, update, rendering are three different functions that should not be together. Why? Because when you put them together, they become deterministic. And you got, you got to think of what that does. It actually can mess you up. You make it more input lag. Example of that would be, I want to update something. But if I put my input inside my update loop, as an example, then what is going to update first? I, I hit something, I hit my button, but before I get to move, I got to wait for the update loop to hit again, right? As opposed to if I put it in a separate function, a lot of times we can have less input lag, especially if you want to run it in a separate process, okay? So this is something that you may want to try and do. Not multi-threading here. We're talking about the same thread, all right, but in a different process. Okay, um, so that's what the update method does. It, it kind of updates our logic a lot of times, and we've seen that before. We want to include an update method, not just for our main game, but for each game object. Every game object should have its own way of updating its logic, which is what Unity supports. If you notice each in our, uh, in our loop up here, we have this game logic update, where the game logic update, what we do is we take a script uh, as an example, and we attach it to a game object, we allow that game object to update itself. And the, the update function actually connects to, the, to the, uh, the greater game loop that's happening in the background, right? So remember, each of these functions in Unity, and doesn't matter whether it's Unity or another commercial game engine, it's tied into the back end, right? And that back end, each one of these things, if you include them in your script, they're going to be tagged and updated. That's why it's a really great idea. If you have nothing updating in your game script, take the update function out. Same thing with the uh, awake and start functions. If you don't have anything that you're initializing, remove the start function, maybe even more important than the update function because start is always called if it's there, right? So make sure that that's gone. All right. so. Um, so again, once per frame, the game loop walks the collection of, of game objects that have subscribed to it. The way you can subscribe to the, to the game loop, we just talked about subscribing. Think about it as a type of observer pattern that's being used. 
when I attach a mono behavior script to a game object in Unity, what am I doing? I'm subscribing to the game loop, the larger game loop, the main game loop in Unity, right? As soon as I do that. If I subscribe to my game loop, that means every time on notify is going to happen, it's going to access that game loop that's sitting inside of that script. And if it's empty, I've just spent a fraction of a calculation trying to update an empty loop. Guys, we don't want that. All right. We want to take those out as much as possible. And finally, today we're going to talk a little bit about frameworks. Some people have a confusion about what's the difference between a framework and a library. Right, so a library is a simple collection of code and data we can use for reuse, whereas a framework is a collection of libraries and tools that go together to solve a given task. Okay, so I would say those are the two differences. People have asked that question a bunch of times. I also want you to think of it like this, right? Sometimes I would say more often, frameworks are more opinionated than a library. Libraries are just plug and play. I want to use this library, I want to use this DLL as an example. A framework makes you do things in a certain way, all right? They want you to call the, the game loop this way. They want you to call the render function this way. They want you to do certain things. Why? It ties into the application programming interface in a certain way because they, you know, they want you as a developer to follow their methodology or their structure, right? So they're mostly more opinionated than libraries. A good example of this is in the web. We have two competing front-end um, libraries. Actually, there's three. One of them is React. The other one is Angular. And a third one is Vue, right? Uh, React is a framework, and it's very opinionated. It requires you to use TypeScript. It requires you to use a bunch of other stuff. Whereas React and Vue are libraries that are plug and play. And that's why React is so much more popular nowadays. Although I would say that Angular is the better, is the better um, structure. It's a, a framework for programmers by programmers. But on the web, it matters what's easier and what's faster. And a lot of times, time is money. If I can develop something quicker, I want to use a library um, as opposed to a framework. All right, so uh, that's what frameworks are. And here's an example of the Ogre 3D's rendering engine. And we're using its framework. Ogre 3D is more. Um, more of a framework, so it's more opinionated than just a, a group of libraries. Um, an example of a, a group of libraries that's out there today, if you're going to program on um, on the web, uh, would be something like CreateJS. Let me just show you this one. And I've used CreateJS for many years now. And for those people who used to be Flash programmers, again, um, not as popular to do web games anymore as they used to be. But back in the day when we used to do um, uh, web games when Flash is banished by Apple, right? Um, Grant Skinner and company created something called CreateJS, which is a series of li little libraries, EaselJS, TweenJS, SoundJS, and PreloadJS, to create uh, all kinds of animation effects uh, on the HTML5 canvas, right? This is an example of a library, right? A bunch of little libraries that come together. It's not a framework. Whereas, if I was to look at something that's online again, let's take a look at Phaser. All right, again, these are just um, some choices. So just so you can compare, if I was going to ask you questions like this, you would know. Here's an example of a framework. Phaser, although it's got packed full of different things, it does things like tile, um, you know, uh, it has a tile loader built in. Um, it has all kinds of stuff. You can, you can target it towards Canvas and WebGL and so on. It's a framework which means that um, in many cases, uh, it is more opinionated. You need to use fra a phaser in a specific way in order for you to do stuff with, with uh, on the web. Whereas it, with CreateJS, you can plug in whichever piece you want. If I just want to do fast animation, I may just want to use TweenJS. Or if I want to use um, you know, the canvas, really do a lot of canvas stuff, maybe I'm just going to use EaselJS. Or if I want to use sound, I'm going to plug in sound into my website. Maybe you just want to use SoundJS. Plug and play. It's decoupled. Each each library is separate and I can choose to use it or not. Okay? Library versus framework. All right. Um, and that's really it for my talk today. I just talked about sequencing patterns and more of how do we see how do we do stuff with our game loop, double buffering, as well as um, um, <clears throat> the update method, what it does, how to use it, and frameworks. Questions around all that kind of stuff today.
So again, straightforward stuff, but I mean, this is part of the theory that you're gonna to need to know, um, especially when it comes to making your, you know, your your concept or your your thoughts, all right, theoretically, and how to make your game engine. You should have an opinion, a philosophy, about how to put your game engine together if you're gonna if you're gonna create your own, and you need to know these things in order for you to do that. Okay, so now the next part of what we're going to be doing today. We're going to take a short break. It's 3.36. We're going to take 10 minutes. We're going to come back at, well, approximately 10 minutes. At 3.45, we're going to come back. And for the remainder of class, I'm going to meet with everybody. I'm going to give you a chance to do your in-class exercise for Lesson 7, which is your um, memory profiling stuff on Unity. And you can find those things with the links that I gave you. So if I go back to this, I've given you two links. I've given you this link, which talks about the, the, the documentation for Unity 2020.1. Uh, it's all around the, mem the profiler tool that comes with Unity for free, which is pretty cool. There's some stuff to turn on. It tells you how to do stuff. There's also a little tutorial video that you can probably run at faster speed. And it's a two hour and 45 minute video. I don't recommend you look at all of it, but it's broken down into different pieces. And what you can do is... Uh, you can go through it. I mean, it's optimized for 2019.3, uh, but I think it works great for uh, Unity 2020 as well. Remember that you're going to be asked to do profiling for Group Assignment uh, 2, Part 3, as well as for your GW project, your term or semester project that you're doing for me. So make sure that at least someone in your group goes through and then is able to explain this to everyone else because you need to, you're going to be tested on this. It could also be on your final exam, which is why I recommend that all of you do this at some point. May not be right now, because for your um, in-class exercise, that's really, I'm giving it to you, that's due on Sunday, which you can probably do today if you really want to. You don't have to do this. You don't have to go through and do all the videos. Most of the information you need is right in here inside this manual. So you can always go through here, getting started and how to do uh, the CPU usage profiler module, which is right here, as well as the memory profiler module, which is uh, I've asked you about right here. Okay, so these are the two modules I need you to turn on and off. And so I'll let you do that in-class exercise while I meet with you guys. So, again, let's not quite 10 minutes. It's seven minutes from now. We're going to meet. I'm going to come back online. Uh, I'm going to take a short break. Uh, I'm going to stop the video, the YouTube video for today. There's no more YouTube video after today, after right now, I mean, uh, for today. But we're going to meet with the groups that are physically here so you can do your little checkpoint too. And before I go, it says, uh, Roderick says, is it okay to do the profiling on the bonus version of the individual assignment, like if you implemented the factory or singleton? The bonus version of the individual assignment. Uh, sure. Yeah. Let me talk about that more with you, Roderick. I want to get a, a sense of what you really mean there. Uh, but I think my initial response would be yes. I always like to give you guys options. Options, options, options. Right? So... Let me, uh, let me get back to you on this, but let's take a short break and I'll give you more details. So again, it's 3.39, we'll come back at 3.45 and then for the remainder of the class, I'll meet with your GDW teams. Okay, short break time. I'm gonna stop recording now on YouTube. For those people watching on YouTube, see you next week.